My name is Matt Colville. I'm a writer and a designer in tabletop games and then video games and now tabletop games again. And my YouTube channel is mostly, uh, not exclusively, but mostly about running Dungeons and Dragons and my ongoing attempt to convince you that you should do it because it's fun and not that hard. But the choice to become a dungeon master is different than the choice to buy a bicycle and take up cycling or buy some vinyl and become an audiophile. It's different than reading or traveling or fishing. It's even different than board gaming or playing D&D. Because choosing to become a dungeon master is choosing to lead a creative life. I know that that makes it sound pompous and pretentious, but you're going to create an adventure, NPCs, maybe an entire world complete with characters and plot and dialogue. What could be more creative? Even the minimum amount of work possible. Buying an official campaign setting, buying an adventure still requires you to interpret everything inside and present those ideas as yours. They're players in your campaign, not Wizards of the Coasts. This means you have more in common with a musician or a writer or an actor or a YouTuber than you do with a cyclist or an audiophile or a gamer. Leading a creative life, however you do it, relies on having, among many other things, a little sense somewhere inside you that your ideas, your music, your writing, your game is something other people might be interested in. In other words, you need to believe that when you express yourself, other people might think your ideas are neat. And that requires a little bit of, choose your word for it, arrogance, hubris, ego. These are all pejorative terms. There is something in our culture, in our psyche, that says this is bad. That wanting to create art is somehow the same as saying, I'm better than you. And because we do not want to be perceived that way, we never try. There are people who, if they found out you wanted to be a, a painter or a writer, would say, maybe behind your back, who does she think she is? And if we hear this often enough from adults when we're kids, from parents and teachers, or our peers, if we hear them saying that about other people who want to do these things, we learn from a very young age, wanting to do this is bad. And then we never try. We have this idea of the tortured artist who creates for no reason other than because they were compelled. They didn't care if they ever sold a painting. I think that idea is largely a fiction. I think mostly they did want to sell paintings. Or at least they wanted people to see them and like them. They hoped desperately people would hear their music and like it. Maybe they didn't write a book because they wanted to be rich or famous, but they definitely wrote it hoping people would read it. But we have that tortured artist archetype because we in this culture have a deep suspicion of people who have any other motivation. Think that their art might be interesting to other people. It's one of the reasons we talk so much about how much money art makes. If you Google any artist, the autocomplete will always ask you if you want to look up their net worth. That says a lot. We're okay with making money from art because money has tangible value and utility. More words are wasted every week on how much money a movie made than what it might have meant. It's perfectly acceptable to want to be a singer or a rapper because you want to get rich. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Our culture rewards that attitude. But doing it because you're compelled, because you have something inside you you need to say, because you want to reach people and change what they think or how they feel, well, that's hubris. Ego. Think about what we're taught about art. Art hangs in a museum. We go to museums when we're kids to get educated. As adults, we feel like we should go to the museum, see some art, be cultured. But those paintings were painted by artists, and none of them thought, gosh, I hope this ends up in a museum where kids on a field trip will see it. They did not make art to be an assignment for students or a burden for people who feel guilty they're not more cultured. They created art because they wanted to challenge people. They wanted to change how they thought, how they saw the world. They had ego. There are lots of reasons you, that's right, I'm talking to you aren't running D&D right now, you might not have time. You might think you don't know anyone who wants to play. But if you're afraid of putting yourself out there, if it feels like sitting behind the screen and spinning an entire world out of nothing but words and dramatic gestures and silly voices is something you could never do because it requires arrogance or hubris or ego, well, I am here to say it is okay to have an ego. It is okay to imagine that someone might think your ideas are cool. This is not a flaw. It is not something to be ashamed of. It is not presumptuous, even though some people around you will act as though it is, because it does not presume this makes you better than other people. 
If you've been raised by people who value art and encourage expression, this video may seem weird to you. But believe me, there are people out there who don't take those values for granted, who will say to someone who wants to make art, don't stand out, don't think you're special, don't think you're better than us. I think those people are trying to keep you down. They're trying to put themselves above you by controlling you. Don't let them. Some people will tell you that wanting to create art is only for a certain class or kind of person and that you are not it. They have some self-loathing in them. And if they can trick you into not trying, then they don't have to confront their own sense of inadequacy. Those people are trying to control you. Don't let them. I started this channel because I wanted to make more Dungeon Masters, but there are people who watch or see how popular the channel is, and they imagine that I am full of myself. I am constantly taking the piss out of myself, I regularly look like an idiot on purpose, and I routinely explain that my way is not the only way or even the right way. I make entire videos about the ways in which I've screwed up, and I explicitly say I could do it again, and people comment about how full of myself I am. Because in this culture, just wanting to make YouTube videos is seen by some people as an act of hubris. It won't surprise you to learn I have never experienced imposter syndrome. I have no advice for someone who has. I have never wondered if people would someday discover I am actually a crap writer or a terrible dungeon master or a bad YouTuber. I was, however, perfectly willing to be terrible at all of those things for a long time and not worry too much about it. I hated my writing when I started out. I really, really hated it because we develop taste long before we develop skill. In other words, we all know we suck way before there's anything we can do about it. But I believe my ideas were cool. I was wrong about that too, my ideas were terrible. But like everything else, I got better. There were always people in my life who accused me of being a self-obsessed egomaniac. This isn't new. It's not a criticism I get because of the success of this channel or the Kickstarter. It's something I heard when I was a teenager. And these are things I've often thought about myself. These are terms I have used to describe myself. Sometimes jokingly. I still tend to focus on my failings. I take criticism much more seriously than praise. Those of you who've been in the community a long time may recognize this. Focusing on your flaws, being critical of your work, thinking it's not very good, doesn't make you a failure or an imposter. It just makes you a normal artist. It is a critical component of getting better. You will always be your own harshest critic, and you should be. It's how you're going to get better. Don't mistake that for being cynical. Don't let it bring you down. You need that sense of which bits sucked in order to improve, and you will improve. Just keep doing it. There are some things you'll never master. I'm terrible with plot. It's why I love being a dungeon master. The players tell me what happens next. But because plotting does not come naturally to me, it's the thing I work the hardest on. There are some people who don't like my stuff. Of course there are. Doesn't matter what your favorite book or movie or song is, someone hates it. This will happen to you. Some of your players may not like your game. Doesn't mean it's bad, just means it's art. Art creates those reactions in people, love and hate and indifference. I started this series three years ago by telling you that I knew you could do this, that being a dungeon master is fun and it's a lot easier than it looks and it doesn't matter if you suck at it for a while, you'll have fun even while you're sucking at it. I think it's time now to tell you the other half, which is it's okay to think your ideas are cool and that people might like them. If you give it a shot and feel embarrassed later at the ridiculous, tropey, cliched, poorly thought out nonsense you put in front of your players, it doesn't mean you were wrong and that you should stop. It means the opposite. It means you got to keep doing it until you learn how to develop those cool ideas so that when you put them in front of people, they will say, neat. That's it, folks. Just something I thought you might need to hear. Until next time, peace out.